there we go. We're going to kick it off. So I'm going to pass this over to Henry and Miriam. And just one more time, double check that you are on mute. Go ahead and stay on mute until uh, the question and answer period. Once you are addressed, once we ask if you are um, ready to ask your question, you can go ahead and unmute and then engage with our presenters. All right. Henry, and, uh, Miriam, take it away. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Henry Walters. Uh, uh, co-founder of Atelier Drome, and, and with me is Miriam uh, Hinden, one of our principal architects. Uh, Atelier Drome is an architecture, interior design, and branding studio in Pioneer Square, and we've designed hundreds of uh, restaurant, retail, and office projects uh, in the Seattle area over the last decade. The goal of our presentation today is to give the first time or even experienced small business owner a better idea of the process ahead for the design and permitting of your new brick and mortar space. We'll touch on key players, things to consider when looking at potential spaces, the phases of design. We'll do a little deeper dive into the schematic design phase, as well as what we're seeing right now regarding construction costs for projects like yours. Why will, why we, while we will be primarily talking about rules of thumb for restaurants today, we'll also touch a bit on retail as well. And with that, I'll hand it over to Miriam. We'll start by explaining the key players involved and their roles. Good morning. So first, we're going to talk about the key players, as Henry mentioned. There are typically about 10 key players involved in your project. The first is the owner or the landlord, and that is the person um, that owns the building that is listing your space for rent or lease. There's the tenant, which is you. There's the owner's agent or listing agent who is representing the landlord as a real estate agent. And they are assisting with negotiations and preparing the lease for the landlord. And then there's the tenant's real estate agent. And that is the person representing you and assisting you with negotiating and preparing your lease. And they are usually, usually paid for by the landlord upon closing of the transaction. And then there is the tenant's real estate attorney, and that's who you would use to review the lease to make sure it is fair to you. There's an architect or designer, and that's what Henry and I do. Um, and your architect is really your advocate to listen and translate your dream into a design that can be permitted and built. Um, and the architect will also coordinate with other consultants and obtain all of the permits that you need generally. Um, and then there's the contractor, and they're the ones who are going to be building your space using your drawings, and they are responsible for coordinating with all of the different trades, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, um, there's a lot of them, but that's really what they're working on to put your space together. Yeah. And then if your space is in a historic district or is a landmark, then you would have to go to them to have them review any changes in the use of your space or any changes of the design to the building exterior. And then there's the Seattle Office of Economic Development. They assist small businesses with navigating all of their requirements and regulations, and then they can help connect you to small business development resources. And then there's also neighborhood organizations like the Alliance for Pioneer Square, and they provide connections and referrals to small business services that are really helpful. So um, hopefully by the time you're starting to look at a space, hopefully you've called an architect or designer like us um, because there's some important things to consider when you're starting to look at spaces. Uh, what you see on the right is a, a diagram of an existing empty space. And we're gonna use that as a, a little, uh, example throughout this presentation. But it's important to, to think about the size of the space, the shape of the space, you know, uh, the ceiling heights, uh, the exposure of the space to the sun and, and to your neighbors. And um, uh, is it an old building, uh, you know, brick, or is it more uh, newer concrete and glass and steel? Um, what are the surrounding uses uh, to that space? And are they compatible with the use that you're thinking about? Um, how do you get deliveries in there? Uh, how does someone in a wheelchair or visually impaired uh, get in and out of your space? And then what are your storage options? Those are a few of the physical properties. 
Also really important uh, later on as we get you your building permit are uh, understanding where the existing exits are and if there are enough of them. Um, if there's a sprinkler system in the space um, and if that's required for your use. And then what sort of fire ratings are on the surfaces that, uh, that uh, uh, enclose your space, your walls and ceiling and floor, those might come into play. Uh, it's really important also to understand what the existing use of that space was. Now, uh, there's a real important distinction here. We, we want to know um, what the, the current permitted use of the space was. Um, it, the last tenant may or may not have gotten their permit, and uh, we need to know what the last permitted use of the space is, because that's what the city considers when, uh, as we're uh, obtaining your building permits. So we need to know that and, and also your proposed use. And knowing those things will affect sort of the permitting track, uh, whether uh, we have to go in for a change of use, for instance, with a, a historic district, um, if there will be other upgrades required because of that change of use in your building permit. Other things that are important to think about is, do you have enough electrical coming into the space, enough gas, uh, water? Uh, what is the heating and air conditioning situation like in your space? Uh, is that something the landlord pays for or will you need to pay for it? Um, how do you access garbage and where do you store your garbage uh, until then? Uh, other important considerations, um, like Miriam mentioned, uh, understanding if you're in a historic district, um, that will add weeks or months of time to the permitting process because we have to talk to them first before we talk to the building permit and get special permission. Um, we need to know pretty quickly also how many occupants are going to be in your space. And that's not how many people you'd like to be in your space or how many tables and chairs you plan on having. It's actually a math problem that this diagram sort of shows. Um, it's, it's a function of how large the space is and what are the uses going on inside the space. And that tells us how many occupants will be in the space. And that tells us, uh, that answers questions uh, whether we need one or two exits or if we need fire sprinklers and, and some other things. You know, part of living in a beautiful town like Seattle is we've got these beautiful old buildings, um, a lot of character. And um, uh, sometimes those those old buildings though, if we're changing the use or, or uh, uh, improving them uh, to a high degree, the city will require us to uh, upgrade the building either structurally or life safety or, or, or with additional ins insulation. So uh, we need to know those things very quickly um, so that we know uh, the scope of work involved in your project. It may be, for instance, a more expensive project than you're imagining because the city is requiring upgrades to the space. Um, also, you know, in, in most of downtown Seattle, we have this really cool uh, situation where the street has been raised, as some of you might know, and there are opportunities to sometimes to occupy the space underneath the sidewalk, for instance. We've done that on a couple of projects, but also thinking about uh, sidewalk, how you use your sidewalk. So now we're going to talk about the phases of design. So this graphic shows a really generic, typical schedule overview of all of the design phases leading up to construction from when the architect gets involved. It starts with pre-design, which is really the shortest phase, then moves into schematic design, and then design development, which is really the longest design phase that you would go through. Um, we are showing it right now as 13 to 7 weeks, but that can vary depending on your project. Um, and then there's construction drawings, and once those are done and all your permits are approved are when you can start construction and get to that final exciting milestone of being ready to open. And you'll notice that we've also included some milestones for if you're in a historic building or in a landmark district, and those are really going to lengthen the project a little bit. Um, and so it would be shorter if you're not. Yeah, I think it's important to note too, this is a, a, a an example of a schedule, but your, your schedule may flex uh, either way, depending on uh, what you're doing and the condition of the space and how much work is required and what kind of permits are required. So the first phase is pre-design. And this is where your architect is gonna meet with you and go over your project's requirements. They're going to talk about goals and objectives and prioritize your wants versus your needs. Your architect will also research all of the relevant codes and regulations from the city and the county. 
And then another important step is that they will go to the space and they will measure it and take a lot of photos, basically getting good documentation of it to prepare as built drawings. Um, we'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, and then if it's needed, you can also have a pre-submittal conference with the city of Seattle. And that's really helpful when there's like an unusual condition or a specific code question that the architect wants to get feedback from the city on, on record and in writing. So this is that example of an as-built of that space that Henry showed you before. You can see that we've located the plumbing fixtures that are there, all of the walls, uh, the windows along the front, uh, the doors, and then it has the total size of the space along with its relationship to the sidewalk. The next phase is schematic design. And that's where your architect takes your goals and vision and translates them into a space plan. So this is a really exciting part of the project. Um, they will also start a concept board so you can start understanding the look and feel of your space. Uh, they will talk about materials and systems needed um, if there's anything to include for early pricing. And if you're working on a brand, this is a really good time to start the process to tie in your design for the logo and graphics. And usually um, this is a great time to get preliminary pricing from a builder so you can understand the cost for your project. Um, the contractor will take the pre-lease space plan, a concept board and preliminary pricing guidelines to put together a good number so you can understand that initial rough cost. And this is also ideal to have before you sign the lease for the space. So here's an example of a space plan. You can see that it shows the front seating area, the bar, uh, the number of tables and chairs and seats, uh, the two bathrooms, the kitchen, the dish pit, the walk-in, and then also there's a fair amount of outdoor seating to really take advantage of that sidewalk location. And on the right is an example of a concept board so you can really understand the look and feel of the space and the contractor can understand the type of materials you want and the level of detail and quality for the project. And, and literally these two drawings that you see right here, these two graphics, plus maybe a list of uh, assumed finishes is really all that an experienced builder needs to put together that first rough order magnitude pricing with the goal of giving you an idea of approximately what it's gonna cost before you sign the lease. And then the next phase is design development. And this starts when your lease is signed. And it's where your architect takes your design that you developed for schematic design and really develop it into technical drawings and details that are needed for getting your building permit. The architect will coordinate with consulting engineers, like if you need structural, mechanical, electrical, or plumbing. Um, and really that this whole process is about getting that building permit. Um, and then they would also revise that concept board that you did before to make sure it's really reflecting the current design and update the outline specifications with that next level of detail. And this phase is also when you would go to the historic or landmark board for approval if you need it. Also, this is when you're going to want to reach out to a kitchen equipment uh, supplier um, because lead times on, on a kitchen equipment um, can be uh, pretty long. So we want to get that process started of ordering equipment. And these are some examples of what's typically provided as part of that permit. Um, so you ha would have anything really important to your space, like kitchen equipment, all of that specified and included in the drawing so that you can understand the cost for that down the road. Um, and they're needed for your space to function if you're a restaurant. Um, sometimes you will have a rendering of the space so you can really understand the look and feel and then also CAD drawings that are provided to show that next level of detail along with exact dimensions and everything that the building department really wants to see. And then the next phase is construction documents. So the permit drawings are really a subset of the entire construction document set. Um, and we start these while we're waiting for the city to review the permit drawings. 
And this is when we take those permit drawings and we fully develop and finalize the, the design in order for the contractor to know how to build your space. So we'll work on construction details, finalizing materials and finishes. Um, it's also a great time to select and procure your furniture, light fixtures, or anything you have in your space that wasn't previously talked about. Um, and it's also a great time to continue that coordination with your brand identity and your logo. Um, and really, this whole set is for the contractor to give you that final bid for your project so that you are ready to start construction as soon as you get that permit. It's really important that the contractor have as much information as possible uh, because it will save you money later um, in avoiding change orders, what are called change orders, which are changes late in the process, which are going to cost more money. Yeah. And these are some examples of what is provided um, in construction documents. Um, we've included an example of an interior elevation that's showing this restaurant space. You can see the light fixtures, the built-in casework, there's seating. Um, there's a lot of detail around what's happening on the walls and with storage and display, and even looking into the kitchen. So the contractor can really understand the space and what they're building. Um, it's also a time when you would have a material board. So you can see all of your finishes together in one place. Um, and then there's also interior elevations that are very detailed that show where you have tile, um, your fixtures for your sink and your toilet, um, and then what your doors are going to look like. So you really understand the way that the space is going to look and feel when it's built. And then construction phase services start when you have your permit and your contractor really has everything they need to start construction. Um, your architect is usually available for regular meetings on site to clarify details or any questions that come up um, or if there's anything unforeseen that happens, like they're usually always available to help out and come out on site. Um, and then really the end result of this is that the design is built as you envisioned and you're ready to open. It's really exciting time. Um, these are some photos of our projects under construction. Um, and as architects, we love seeing this happen. It's really exciting for us. Now we're going to take a deeper dive into the schematic design phase, which is the yellow line on that on that time scale that um, we started with. Um, just a refresher: here's that uh, as-built plan with a with a, uh, a restaurant laid out. Um, I'm going to kind of go into each area and talk a little bit about rules of thumb for each, but really what we need from you before we start a pre-lease plan for a restaurant or retail or anything is, you know, understanding what is your big idea? Uh, what is your concept? Um, we want to understand that. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. What are your food preparation procedures and your menu? Uh, do you have any uh, desired kitchen and bar equipment um, specific to your menu? Do you have any process that you know a certain equipment needs to be adjacent to other equipment? We want to understand all of that starting design because our first focus, at least with restaurants, is designing the kitchen. Uh, and, and here's what you see here. So we're zooming in on the kitchen. And then uh, a few rules of thumb for kitchens is, um, like I said, this is usually where we start design because it's so important that it, the kitchen functions and works well. Um, many customers like to see the kitchen and, and watch the chef. So uh, much of our work is an open kitchen concept. Um, some some chefs don't like that. So, you know, it's every design is different. Uh, but an open kitchen does allow the sights and the sounds and the smells of, of your process to take center stage. And, you know, customers really kind of dig that uh, to, to watch uh, the craft. Um, but of course, you know, we need to be able to hide some things like your dishwashing area and your walk-in. So, uh, and then typically um, a kitchen and bar area, just rule of thumb, uh, generally is about 30 to 40 percent of the size of your space. And uh, that can flex, though, if it's a much smaller space, though those uh, uses could take up even half of the space. Your projects here. Next area on the plan is the bar, um, as you can see here. Uh, a bar can be a great way to attract more customers to stay for dinner and increase revenue. Uh, we generally like to place our bars 
close to the front of the restaurant, vis easily visible from the sidewalk and the street so folks can see your back wall and, and uh, get a sense of what's going on inside. Um, a rule of thumb for a bar, uh, eight to 12 seats is a good start and then sort of adjust from there depending on the size and shape of the space. A few of our bars we've designed. Next is the dining room. It's really important in a dining room to offer a variety of seating options. Um, tables and chairs allow for very flexible layouts to accommodate different size groups. Um, banquettes or benches are great for dividing up a large space or running along a wall and offer quick seating op options for large parties. Um, booths are a cozy alternative, but not as flexible as banquettes or tables and chairs. Uh, generally square and rectangular tables are, are easier to combine. Um, and, you know, something else to consider is, is consider opening your dining room to, to the outdoors in some way. Um, often that, that can take the form of a sliding window or a bifold window system that, uh, connects the interior to the exterior and allows the smells and the sounds of your restaurant to sort of, uh, come out, permeate out and draw people in. Um, but something, if, if the space is large enough, we really recommend a private or semi-private dining area that can uh, function as a event space um, for revenue. But when it's not when it's not um, functioning uh, as a as a private dining room, something like a semi-private dining area that opens out to the main dining can then um, function as as main dining when it's not being used. A few of our dining rooms. Uh, and and we, we, we also need to touch on outdoor seating. I, I think this is often overlooked as an important um, aspect of a design. Maybe not so much anymore with COVID. Uh, everyone's been uh, outside. But, you know, outdoor seating in, in our area is, is great three-season seating if you have a covered area. It's also great uh, signage and uh, vision um, to folks farther down the street to sort of draw them to your space. Um, you can serve alcohol outdoors with a with a permit through SDOT, and um, like I said, you uh, within reason we can make it uh, a three season space with a covering and and uh, and heaters. Here's some examples of our outdoor seating. So uh, here's the here's the finished restaurant design in, in our hypothetical space, and I thought it would be fun to show you. Uh, rules of thumb not to do in, in the same space. So here's a plan that where we just sort of threw the rule book out the window and we made a bunch of bad, bad decisions here. So you'll notice a whole bunch of round tables in a space with no room to circulate. Uh, the bars tucked in the back. The the men's restroom is 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 too small, A, and B, it, it opens out onto the dining room. That's not a good look. Um, the women's restroom, you've got to go through the kitchen to get to. That's not even allowed by code. So you know, there's a thousand ways to design a, a really bad space and, and a few good good ways to design a good one. So now we're going to talk about construction costs. So we recommend having a contractor provide pricing really early on during pre-lease um, so that you really understand how much your space is going to cost before you get too far along in the process. Um, one way that everyone um, estimates costs very early on is through dollars per square foot. I'm sure you've heard of that. Um, restaurant builders tend to use 350 to 450 a square foot uh, for their cost estimations. And that does not include finishes or like kitchen equipment. And it doesn't include like if it's an older building or if there's anything really unusual about the space. So if you have a restaurant that's about 1,300 square feet in size, you might expect that your construction cost would be 455 to 585 K. Um, and for a retail space, it's usually a lot less, um, about 175 a square foot to 250 a square foot. And it's really important that you are able to find a builder or contractor that's experienced in your type of space. So if you're um, building a restaurant, you want a contractor that is really experienced with building restaurants. Definitely. Um, and they can be really hard to find. Um, but once you do find them, it's really good to get on their schedule really early on so that you have them involved throughout the whole design process. 
Another thing to think about is the systems costs. And this is a level of design detail that happens during design development. Um, so your contractor would update pricing to include these numbers then. Um, electrical is about $25 to $45 a square foot. Plumbing, $45 to $55. Um, HVAC systems run about three to four K per ton. So that would be for air conditioning or any uh, um, new ventilation, ventilation system required by the city for the space. Um, and then if you have a type one hood for grease producing cooking, um, then it's about 50 to $100,000. Um, a type two hood, which is generally used for light duty, non-grease cooking. Um, and if you have a high temp dishwasher, it's about 30 to 50 K. And then construction costs normally include mechanical, electrical, and plumbing fi fixtures and systems. Uh, the kitchen hood, you'll see that contractors include a construction contingency that's usually about 10 to 15%. And that's in case anything comes up during construction that you weren't expecting. And so you'll uh, happen to see this go down as a design develops as there's more unknowns resolved earlier on. Um, and then you'll also see a line item for builders profit and overhead. Um, and overhead tends to be about 10 to 15% and profit about eight to 10%. And this also really depends on the contractor. It always varies. Um, but then also keep in mind that there is Washington state sales tax on top of all of this. So whatever the current tax rate is, um, it's important to think about that too. 10.1%, I think. Um, and then construction costs don't include usually tables and chairs, uh, the kitchen and bar equipment. So like your stove, oven, um, dishwashers, if you're a restaurant or a food space, uh, walk-in coolers, and then any kind of audio, video, or security systems. And it's important to remember that there could be other potential costs that come up during the project. So there's the real estate agent fees that we talked about earlier, um, the architect fees and any consultants that were needed. So like structural engineers or mechanical or electrical or plumbing, um, and then the cost for a permit from the city of Seattle or King County, um, and then your kitchen and bar equipment costs, and then anything that you're using day to day in the space. So furniture, silverware, plates, menus, all of that is additional costs that's not gonna be included in the contractor's estimate. I know this is a lot of information in the process and hopefully it's giving you a better picture of what to ask for and what to expect as you consider opening your own brick and mortar business in Seattle. Of course, there's much more detail involved in all of this. We've tried to make it as accessible to the most people as we can, and we'd love to help you navigate it all if you decide to move forward. We'll make this PDF presentation available uh, to Camille, uh, Camille and her team um, uh, for you folks to download if you'd like afterwards. And, and with that, we'd like to open the floor to questions. Wonderful. Thank you to Henry and Miriam. That was so helpful. I would love to kick off the question and answer period. About 50% of our uh, audience members today are food businesses of one sort or another. Um, but I wondered for our retail businesses, sort of what sort of specific um, guidance points you would offer for retail businesses in the schematic design phase, thinking about showcasing goods or facilitating spaces for classes or just anything that you can think of that would be specific to a retail um, opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, want me to take that one? Sure. Perfect. Yeah, um, we, we've definitely designed retail spaces a, a lot less than than uh, restaurants, but I would say, you know, it, starting with what's understanding what your big idea is, what are you selling? What sort of display needs do you need? Um, uh, maybe, maybe you, maybe you need, maybe you know the lineal feet of display space that you need or, or the method that, that you'd like to display it. Um, I think getting as much of that out of your head to us is a great starting point. And then from there, we can we can practice a few rules of thumb that, that we've experienced over the years. For instance, you know, maximizing window display, uh, keeping things low in the front and higher in the back. Uh, lighting is super important for, for retail uh, display. Um, thinking about your process, the, the, the flow of, of folks through your space. 
Um, if you're selling clothes, do you need a, 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 a booth or two to, to try them on? What sort of back stock requirements you might have? You know, are you going to be carrying a lot of back stock or are you going to be ordering as you, as you run out? Um, uh, what is your method of uh, your point of sale system? Um, uh, that sort of thing. I think just, uh, <laughs> I think that's an answer. Uh, but getting as much of that in advance from the client as possible uh, is super helpful. Wonderful. Thank you. So I'm going to pass this over to Lisa, who is going to start um, organizing questions in the chat. If you have a question, something that popped up um, during the presentation or something that you came to this presentation uh, with interest in learning, please go ahead and drop it in the chat. Uh, and we'll start just at the top there. So Lisa, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, so for our first question, um, we have, how do you find out what a spaceless pyramid is for? So I can take that one. Um, usually uh, the city of Seattle has uh, microfilm archives and they can um, basically provide you with all of the permit records that they have on file um, for the address. And so that's something that we often use in order to figure out what an existing space was actually permitted for. Yeah, um, and the city is over the last five or so years has been slowly scanning everything out of microfiche into essentially PDF or image files. So uh, going to their website and uh, entering an address, go, going to the microfiche uh, page and entering an address should get you what they have. Now, I will caution you that the older a building is, the less chance that the city is going to have any records at all. Um, but it's a good place to start. And sometimes if it's not on their website, they might have it in their actual like microfilm um, archive. So if you don't find anything online, then it's good to reach out to that email. Can you talk a little bit about how you partner with ancillary design firms like Shoe Permits? What do they do for you and requirements? And what does the relationship look like? Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, I will say that uh, our firm uh, ourselves, for the most part, we do, we are the kitchen designer. Now, now I say that um, as, as someone who is not a chef. <laughs> We've designed literally hundreds of restaurants, so we have a pretty good idea how to lay a kitchen out. But uh, someone like Bar Greens, uh, I believe Heather Nusifor is on the call today. Uh, she is a good friend and a great collaborator on that. Um, it's important to, uh, we will often start a kitchen and bar layout and then work with someone early on in, in schematic design or design development like Bar Greens to help actually specify that equipment and provide pricing options. And like I said earlier, it's really important we start that process early because of the lead times involved. Um, uh, in general, I believe that design should be a very collaborative process between designers, and we've done some of our best work with other designers, uh, you know, it, uh, so I, I think it's about fostering a, an, a, an atmosphere of collaboration and sort of joyful creation um, that we do our best work in. Another great question here about finance. Um, how does TI system finance? I can. I mean, we, we, we're typically not involved in the financing of projects, but having just moved our office uh, about a week and a half ago and, and being a, a, a new tenant myself, I can tell you that, yes, um, landlords will often... Um, offer a combination of uh, a, a tenant build-out allowance and or free rent. And it really depends on who the landlord is. If it's a if it's a new building versus old building, if it's a large uh, entity that owns the building versus a, a, a local family. So uh, I, I can't get into much more specifics than that other than to say it's, it, it's important in our experience that you have an agent representing you in that process. Very often, um, a, a building owner will will have a, a listing agent who is representing their interests and and bringing the space to market. But you need to have someone in your corner who can help you negotiate terms that are fair. And if I could just break in, Brian, um, Susanna Tran, who produced the commercial real estate um, commercial leasing 
webinar is a commercial real estate broker, and I believe she expanded more on your question in her presentation. So if you scroll to the top of the chat, there is that link to our learning labs and our support hubs, um, and you may be able to find um, an answer from the perspective of a broker within that webinar. I think she can go into much more detail, Brian. Insight into that's, a, that's a good that's a good question that's very relevant these yeah. days unfortunately yeah. um i think you can do things from the outside um, on the storefront some landlords will let you do um, a pull down gate on the inside of your storefront to keep people from breaking through the window and that way it's very discreet and you can't see it during the day but at night because it's on the interior you can hide it really well and then it can be pulled down and locked so that you're secure overnight um i will say there's some easy low-hanging things design wise that we can do to minimize theft you know um in a retail uh space for instance placing the uh, the staff uh, at, at, in a location where they can easily see the majority of the store, there's no hidden corners or, um, you know, putting, putting shelving sort of uh, uh, parallel to the, the staff members line of sight, not perpendicular. Um, that's, that's an easy one. I think, uh, you know, we, we designed spaces that are sort of standalone, but also in lobbies. So a, a coffee shop we recently did uh, is, is basically in the open with no walls in a lobby, but that lobby has got 24 hour security. So you know, understanding perhaps if the building offers uh, uh, 24 hour security. Also, maybe considering extra uh, back, back, store, back stock uh, or storage for placing things, getting them off your shelves uh, when you're closed and placing them in, a, in an area that isn't visible from the front. That's all we have in the chat. Is anyone want to unmute themselves and maybe come on the chat with any experience or questions you have? Oh, yeah. Um, hey there. Uh, my name is Yes Segura. Um, I'm the founder of Smashbox. It's an urban planning and design firm, but we also sell map art. Um, looking to one, I already am about to move into a space actually today in the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Really excited and wanting to turn it into a queer, transgender, uh, BIPOC shared co working space. Yeah, have y'all ever worked on anything similar to that? Do I have any advice? We've definitely done some co-working space, like Orange Studios was one in in uh, over on the east side. Um, yeah, I mean, do you have any specific questions to that use type? Uh, furniture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are there any uh, great places to be like uh, other than Goodwill? Um, <laughs> furniture. Well, uh, you know, I will say our very first office, uh, we had a very low budget and we went to Ikea and we bought some tops and some legs and we somehow made those work for 12 years. And we we just last week graduated to uh, to, to desks that we had a, a friend of ours build. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't uh, uh, discount having someone build some nice desks out of like maybe some uh, uh, apple ply or maple ply and some real simple legs. Um, Sometimes people use doors like off the shelf or, yeah. you know, that don't have panels on them and they just put legs on them and that's really, they actually look really nice. We did that for a few years too. Yep. Yeah. Um, but I think also like there's plenty of people, I think, unfortunately, they're selling a lot of office furniture, especially when they're upgrading. So I think resale is always great. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw someone on the chat said duckies, which I totally okay. use that too. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. I'm trying to stay away from uh, you, Lennon. Or you, you line? Um, oh, you line, yeah. Yeah, I'm right. Kind of away from that. Um, yeah, I know. I want to make sure that this space is ADA accessible. Right. Um, and thanks. I'll reach out to y'all, and maybe y'all can come visit the space. Uh, Absolutely. Eight, yeah. Yeah, Eighth and Jackson, but moving in today later. Oh, oh great my location. gosh, that's amazing. Yeah, you're not too far from us, actually. We're we're uh, Jackson and the uh, Occidental, basically. All right. Great. Close to that. Yeah. Congrats. 
And then what's the initial process to get to working with you guys? Well, that's a great question. Um, generally, uh, you can reach out to info at Atelier Drome Architecture or call our number at 206 395 4392. And what we'll do is get a little bit of information from you. I believe that there is a, a, a web form also on our website, correct? Um, that might be an even better way to start because uh, that collects a little bit of information about you and your project. And then one of our um, uh, one of our staff would reach out and schedule a free uh, one hour consultation um, over video or in person if if uh, if you'd prefer. We'll just talk about your goals and go into a little bit more detail about what we talked about today about the process and timeline. We'll show you some examples similar to what you've seen today. And then we would write uh, what we call a letter of agreement for the pre-lease design services and go from there. And it's we can usually get in and see someone in, you know, within uh, a week or two of you reaching out. Yeah. Love to love to chat. Okay, we'll just hold space for the next couple of seconds. If anybody is uh, interested in asking a question, they can go ahead and unmute themselves at this time. And I'll just draw attention that Lisa has dropped a link in the chat to where you would schedule those initial um, consults as well as the contact info for Atelier Drome. I hope that I hope that we've presented it. it it's a it's a very technical, uh, detail oriented process, and we've really tried to make it as approachable as possible. But there's definitely more detail we can share uh, offline if you if you need to know more about anything we talked about today. All right. Well, I think we'll wrap up. Henry, Miriam, Lisa, thank you so much for guiding us through this today. Um, we will be sharing the PDF presentation via email, as well as links to where you can find more information in our learning labs and when um, we're ready to disseminate the recorded um, webinar, we'll send that along as well. We'll make sure that Lisa's link to scheduling a consult as well as um, contact information is also in that summary email. But I think that's it for today. Thank you all so much for being here with us. And have a sunshiny weekend. It's an opportunity. Thank and thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks for coming. Bye all. Bye-bye.